let me briefly introduce the speakers today, um, who are uh, Kai Ambrose, who many of you will know, is a founder member of the Outcome Mapping Learning Community, um, one of its very first practitioners, uh, currently a steward of the Outcome Mapping Learning Community, brings an enormous wealth of experience. She works at the moment supporting the Caribbean Development Bank Office of Evaluation and as an independent evaluation consultant. So great to have you with us here, Kaya. And uh, joining her uh, giving the presentation um, and discussion is Simon Hearn, um, who probably you all know as the coordinator of the Outcome Mapping Learning Community and also an independent consultant. He mainly works with researchers and research programs on all aspects of outcome mapping. Um, myself, in case you don't know, I'm Richard Smith. I'm one of the stewards of the Outcome Mapping Learning Community. I've been a practitioner of outcome mapping for 10 years now, um, using outcome mapping inside organizations and supporting others as Simon and Kaya as an independent consultant. And I think it's safe for me to share this with you now that I'm along with Jeff Matthias, um, uh, an incoming chair of the outcome mapping learning community. So look forward to seeing a lot more of you. Right. Without further ado, I think we're on time. I'm going to ask, admit a few more people and ask Kaya to take it away. So please do use your questions, uh, the, the chat to post your questions. And after the about a half an hour presentation, we will come to a, a hopefully a rich discussion session. Over to you, Kaya. Thank you, Richard. Um, just Richard, quickly, when someone comes into the waiting room, can you see that pop up on my screen? Or is it fine? Do you just see the presentation? Just the presentation. It's all okay. good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hi, greetings from Barbados, uh, where I am currently um, located, as Richard said, um, supporting the Caribbean Development Bank in their Office of Evaluation, um, as well as still an active participant um, and steward on the Outcome Mapping Learning Community. Um, and this is the, the first um, webinar that we're hosting in a series of webinars that will happen over the next few months. Um, and I think some people have joined up for several, so that's great. Um, so for this, for this first one, um, Simon and I thought that it would be interesting to um, share some of our experience in developing uh, progress marker journals online and how we've done that um, for a few um, global multi-country um, kind of multi-initiative uh, programs now. Um, and all the programs that we've done um, this for have been associated with the International uh, Development Research Center, um, the folks that originally created outcome mapping coincidentally. Um, but the, the uh, case study I'll kind of present uh, for you today uh, will be based on a specific uh, program. Uh, and that's the prize program, the Pathways to Resilience in Semi-Arid Economies Prize. Uh, this was a, a consortium, um, and it was a large. It was within a larger consortium of, of, of several programs associated with IDRC's climate change uh, resilience uh, program. Uh, and this program's ended. It was five years. It it, it recently ended um, two years ago. Uh, five years, multi-country, multidisciplinary. And why I wanted to use outcome mapping is that a key feature of the program was a research into use piece. So the program really wanted to ensure that the research that they were doing um, around climate change and economic development uh, in this specific region was going to be used by key decision makers. Um, and they wanted to be able to track what that use uh, would look like. Um, and how to bring those decision makers on board and get them excited about the research, get them demanding the research, making sure that the research was responding to their needs and making sure that the research was featuring um, in their, in the decision makers own, own spaces and their own um, policy and practice documents 
So they were, this was a key feature of the program overall, and they wanted to be able to uh, track this. And, and knowing that this research into use process can be complex and it can take a long time. Um, it's about establishing uh, what relationships exist and which ones you want to build and, and sometimes um, building those relationships. Uh, with decision makers can take time as well. So they wanted something that was going to be able to show those nuanced steps of, of building relationships. Um, and that's where outcome mapping and outcome monitoring came into play. Um, the four boundary partners that the, the program decided on um, for groups, kind of generic groups in, in all of the countries, you see the countries listed there, these four generic categories of, of boundary partners were parliamentarians, government entities, the private sector, and, and NGOs and academia. So for each of those boundary partners, um, the program developed a, a set of progress markers for them um, in order to, to monitor and record those, those observations. Um, ME focal points, this is an important kind of level of effort and resource aspect um, of, of being able to uh, develop this online monitoring system. There were ME focal points in each of those countries. Um, and these ME focal points worked with uh, the research teams in those countries to record observations associated with the progress markers. Um, so the first step was to record them in the online form, which Simon is going to explain, um, and then to, to process uh, the data that was coming in, and then to reflect and, and interpret and make sense of it as well. Um, so it was kind of like a, three big um, pieces of work that these m and &E focal points did. Uh, making sure that the observations got into the journals, helping to, to analyze the, the data that was coming out of the journals, and then creating the space and creating the process to reflect with that same research team, okay, what does this mean about our engagement strategies? What can we do better um, and what's going well? Um, and the other kind of resource aspect that made all of this work um, was the support from the Overseas Development uh, Institute, ODI. Um, so ODI was coordinating the whole pro program and uh, within ODI, um, they counted on um, an m and &E, an internal m and &E expert, um, as well as Simon and myself. Um, Simon is kind of internal, external uh, connected with ODI and myself as an, as an external kind of advisor. Um, and so we, the three of us would work closely with the m and &E focal points to design the system, to um, help guide through the process and the reporting, uh, this, the reflection in the reporting process. None of these m and &E focal points were familiar at the beginning with outcome mapping. Nobody had taken an outcome mapping training per se, um, but they were eager to, to try out this very specific um, tool based on, the, based on some of the key steps of, of outcome mapping. Um, this, just this little diagram kind of summarizes um, how we developed the, the progress markers and the outcome journals and the, the process um, of feeding into them um, and then adapting their engagement strategies as well. So the, the kind of key goal, the overall use of the outcome mapping, outcome monitoring system um, was so that the, the research teams could get better in, in how they were engaging with, um, with key stakeholders based on the progress that they were seeing of these key, key stakeholders in terms of interacting with the research and building those relationships. Um, this diagram is part of um, a poster that we developed that kind of goes through all the aspects and summarizes all the aspects of, of the outcome monitoring system. And that's available on the um, outcome mapping learning community. And we'll share that link at the end. Um, and so, uh, of course, the majority on here are familiar with progress markers, um, transformation, evolution of um, key actions and, and interactions and interrelationships. 
um, that go from expect to see to like to see to love to see. So early positive responses, active engagement, and then deeper transformation. Um, and this is just a broad uh, example of, of each of those, sort of starting at the bottom and going up. So um, participating in, in prize events and um, presentations, um, asking questions about the research, moving from that, um, overall wanting to see the, the key boundary partners, we called them key stakeholders um, in this uh, in this project, inviting them, taking, being more proactive, inviting them to policy consultation, um, and then love to see deeper transformation, at, um, incorporating the research into their actual uh, policy development. Um, and so there were many more progress markers underneath all of these. These are just an example. So uh, how did we do it? How did we set up the forms um, and how were the forms filled out? And I'll pass it over to Simon to talk through those. Thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, so the, um, the project, as Kai mentioned, was managed by IDRC. They had a team of people that were um, developing an overarching uh, monitoring system. And they had already set up a system using Google, uh, uh, Google Apps or Google, um, what do they call it? Google Suite. Um, so an organizational Google account that has access to lots of tools. And they had uh, developed mostly the, the uh, tools for logging research outputs and meetings and events. Um, so what I guess what in outcome mapping you would record using a strategy journal, um, what you're doing to try and influence your boundary partners. Um, so they had done that, and they but the, what they hadn't done is anything around outcome logging and outcome um, monitoring. So they left that up to each of the individual consortiums to um, to, to decide how they wanted to manage that. Um, and we were the only one that sort of went down the outcome mapping route and decided to um, to define outcomes in that way and to orient it around boundary partners. <clears throat> and so we we developed an additional form um, that sat quite nicely alongside the existing forms which IDRC had developed. Um, so it was a similar kind of format. It used the same um, accounts for people to log in and and access those forms um, there was a link alongside the other links to access these monitoring forms so it sat quite nicely in the existing system um, and we developed it along the lines of a uh, an outcome journal um, as as uh, developed in the outcome mapping manual um, but because the you know we were able to customize it quite um, uh, quite a lot um, so what you're seeing here is the the first screen of the of the form um, th there are three three input screens and here you're just selecting the project um, there's one of uh, six projects or seven projects in this um, in this whole research program um, you can select the country because each project works across uh, different countries Uh, one of six countries and then you can select the stakeholder group that, um, and Kaya mentioned the the different uh, stakeholder groups or uh, as we were called boundary partner groups um, she mentioned those so you select the stakeholder group um, and then when you click next um, Kaya show the next one it then shows pre-developed pre or agency progress markers and you can see one that you want to record against um, so maybe you've just been at a meeting and uh, a government actor has uh, asked you if you have any research on a particular issue um, that they're currently facing um, so you can record that as a demand for climate change related research um, which is one of the like to sees so you select that and then you go next and then you enter the the detail of what that um, 
particular outcome was? What, what, what did they say? Which meeting were you at when you said it? Um, and then you just hit submit and it gets logged. Um, so it's a good solution to, I think, when, when people use the traditional outcome mapping using the paper forms, you just end up with all this paperwork. Um, but here, once you hit submit, that gets um, automatically input into a spreadsheet, um, which is on, you know, shown on the next slide. You can see what that looks like. So every entry gets logged. Um, you know who submitted it, when they submitted it. You have all of the data that they've submitted in that form. Um, and you can start to um, analyze that straight away because it's in a spreadsheet. So you can look at which countries are you seeing observations. Um, you can look at which stakeholders you're seeing observations. So you're seeing more in government actors and less in media, for example. Um, and then you can look at across the projects and see how different stakeholders are, are, are being observed across the different projects. Um, so you, you can cut the data depending on how you want to uh, see it and what your questions are and maybe how you want to input that into your results framework if that's something that you've got to do. Um, so you can disaggregate it um, any way you want. Um, so if, if I mean, a few things that came up as we were doing this, and this, this, what I've just shown you was the first time we did this. We've then subsequently applied this in, um, in other projects. Um, and Kara and I are, are working with a, a new program, IRC, uh, using a similar setup. Um, and we, you know, we learn, we learn a bit more each time. And in fact, the, the second time we did it, the outcome journal took on a different, um, a different form. We didn't, uh, we didn't specify which progress marker they're reporting against, um, but rather it was more open-ended. They describe some, uh, you know, a significant observation, um, and then underneath they can write down which progress markers they think that applies to. So it gives them a bit more flexibility. Um, but we we also have discovered these other issues to to consider. So ownership of the forms. Uh, is an important thing when you as particularly in Google when you create the form that means you own that data as well so as an external consultant um, which is often the case uh, if you create it you're owning that data and that can cause issues so you've got to figure out who's going to create that form and in which space um, in, in Google, it's difficult because if you're using a Google individual account, that's not actually covered under general data protection regulation, the EU GDPR. So if you're holding personal data, then that could be considered a, a violation of GDPR. If you have an organizational Google account, which is what we had in this case, then it is covered. Um, so that's something important to consider is data protection. Um, you actually have very similar forms available on Microsoft 365 as well. Um, so other platforms are available. Um, and in fact, that goes like in the Google form that will go straight into an Excel spreadsheet. So it's, um, it, it's just as, as useful and, and straightforward. Um, so and, uh, those are the two services I know which give you forms that go directly into spreadsheets. Um, there may be others like um, Survey Monkey, where you can export into, but it's an extra step. Um, so the main advantage of this is, is remote access. You know, people can access um, from different places instantly. Um, you can have multiple people submitting, um, so different people in different teams, all using the same tool. It all goes into the same place. Um, and it's straight into a spreadsheet for analysis. Um, you can also set up um, more customized forms depending on your purpose and um, you can set them up for the different outputs that you're producing as well so not just for outcome data but to record your like a strategy journal for example um, so in the research projects we usually have like a research outputs log um, and an events log because those are the two main strategies for influencing your boundary partners um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's not that complicated and it is actually 
uh, everyone's able to do this. The, to build the form is very straightforward if you're familiar with Google. Um, I'll hand over to Kai for the, the last important bit. Thanks, Simon. Um, so one of the one of the key features of, of outcome mapping, and I think one of the um, powerful features of outcome mapping is that um, it it promotes um, uh, this it, this this uh, this concept of sense making. This need to not just let the data um, stay. Uh, in the forms or in the Excel sheet, but then to to take it and ask, okay, so what? What is this telling us? Um, and how can we use it not just potentially for reporting, um, reporting out to, to donors, but how can we use it in this case as a group of researchers to adapt our strategies of how we build relationships and how we connect with the, the key stakeholders, um, the decision makers that we've identified as our boundary partners and that we wanna see um, change in terms of how they interact with the research. So what is this telling us? Can it, um, first of all, can it tell us, you know, where we might need to collect a little bit more information? Do we need to do a little bit more exploration if we're seeing that um, a particular stakeholder or a particular country is really sitting at the expect to see progress markers for a while and they're not, um, advancing along that change pathway to like to seize um, or love to seize. Um, we can also use it, as you saw, the, um, there's, a, there's a space, a descriptive space where we, you know, we're not just marking what, state, what um, progress marker we observed, but, but we want a description around it. So we can go to those descriptions and anything that's, um, first of all, looking at trends and seeing if there um, are similar descriptions uh, around progress markers. Um, or if there's any positive deviance as well, is there a real outlier that we might want to explore further, either positive or negative, and, and um, ask some more questions around that. So that's the first part of um, kind of making sense of the data is, is there anything else that, that we want to explore? Um, so that was the first question that, that m and &E Focal Points asked themselves when they were just looking at the spreadsheet. Is there anything missing? Do we need to follow up on, on anything? Um, and then they would create a space um, with the researchers um, the, at the institution they were working in um, and ask some, some general questions. Okay, what is everyone seeing? Um, what are significant negative or positive changes that we're seeing? And what is this telling us? Um, and what do we need to do to, to do differently? Um, what do we need to improve on? How, we can, how can we change our, our strategies? So, um, we suggested a, a, a process, like almost like a, we suggested a, a facilitation guide for, you know, this half day kind of mini workshop, internal mini workshop to, to look, at, look at the data. Um, and the output of that workshop, the decisions made, um, their kind of group analysis and sense making and, and interpretation of the data, they would put all of that into a very short report, just a four page um, report like a, a memory of, of and an agreement of, of what that discussion entailed. Um, and that report became part of their, as well, their reporting process for, for, the, for the project. Um, and um, the data also fed from that report, from that interpretation, from that sense making, was it just for their own um, adaptation of their engagement strategies, but uh, it also served to feed into um, midterm reviews, overall program midterm reviews, external evaluations, um, and case studies as well that the that the program developed. They had to develop four case studies over the um, over the course of the five years, and this data around how different boundary partners changed the way they interacted with research became, they could then shift that and help tell a story um, with that data in these case studies. Um, so it had, had various uses um, in the end, uh, the data. So um, this document summarizes
uh, in more detail everything that we've just explained um, and the lessons that we drew from, from this process as well. Um, it explains that uh, the, outcome mo the outcome mapping monitoring wasn't the only monitoring that the project did. They had to do a dashboard of outputs, um, kind of your typical research outputs. Um, there were bigger, richer reports that they had to produce annually, for example. So this was one, one part of it, um, but it was a participatory piece and it was the piece that really focused on the research into use and how is the, how are we engaging the stakeholders so that they can um, use the research. So this is available on the outcome mapping um, learning community and, oops, sorry. My screen is frozen. Is that the end, Simon? Okay, sorry, that is the end side. Um, and maybe I'll just, we, if we can find it, we'll just post it in the chat, that poster that I, uh, that I showed the one diagram on as well, that gives a nice visual of, of how we developed the, the progress marker process. So that is it from us. Richard, I will hand it back to you to, um, I haven't even opened the chat, so looking forward to seeing what, uh, what questions have come up. Great. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Simon, very much. Um, round of applause. Um, I am um, really happy to see many questions have come in. Um, keep them coming. We will try and get through as many as we can. Um, I've been trying to uh, group them together to uh, what questions make sense to, to put to Simon and Kaya um, in a more logical format. I, I think that for me, the place to start among the questions is participation. And there's a question here for, about how to incentivize people to actually use the system um, and how often did they have to fill it out? I can take that one if you want, Simon. Or, yeah, sorry. Go on, <laughs> um, so for us, and this is explained a little bit, the, some of the lessons around that are explained in this document you see on the screen. Um, the m and &E focal points were really a, a, key, um, a key piece of incentivizing the, the larger group of researchers to use the system as well. Um, and they were, they, uh, they were real champions. They were motivated um, to build their own capacity to learn about this new tool. Um, that they, that they saw the, the utility of as well. Um, so they had their own built-in motivation as m and &E professionals. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we tried to, to roll with that so that they got other people excited about using um, the online system. And it varied from country to country, right? Um, in some countries, there was a lot more hand-holding, um, and it was the Amity focal point that really had to be kind of inputting the observations, maybe even with the researcher sitting beside them and kind of both a, at the computer. In other countries, um, the researchers, um, after kind of some capacity building and coaching from the Amity focal points, you know, they gradually felt more, more comfortable with the system. Um, and it's not just about the system itself and the, and the tool itself, the Google Forms itself, but it's the you know, the research into use and looking at that kind of change process of building relationships and engagement with decision makers, that, that in itself was new for the, um, for the researchers. So they also had to get used to this kind of, um, this thinking of, you know, complexity and building those relationships and caring about them as well, not just, okay, I produced my research, so there you go, my job's done. Um, so it wasn't just the, the monitoring the observation, but it was getting them excited about the, the, R, the RIE research into use process as well. Um, the form is meant to be uh, kind of used whenever you see an observation, like you might you know, have a journal, you write down your thoughts, you write down your observations right away. So it's meant to be used that way anytime, like after, a workshop or a presentation, if you heard or saw something, you know, really using your, your power of observation, you know, run to your computer and, and, and note it down in the Google form. That's what it's meant to do. Of course, that takes some practice as well. Um, so what we did was say, listen, at least every six months, and that's when we, we asked them to do these sense-making exercises, at least every six months, just get together. This was the first process of the 
sense making process and make sure all your observations are in there before you kind of start your analysis and your discussion. So um, some, you know, it varied. Some people would use it more frequently, but at least every six months, things were getting inputted. Do you have anything to add to that, Simon? Uh, yeah, one thing. I think, you know, the main point is um, tap into people's own curiosity. Um, they People do want to know the, the kinds of uh, outcomes that their work is contributing to, so tap into that. Um, but also, you know, we I think in most of the projects we've worked on, it's part of the results framework that they are accountable to. Um, so, you know, if, if the results framework says they've got to log 10 uh, written outputs, uh, you know, research outputs by the midterm, then they've got to log them. Um, if they don't log them, they don't get counted. Um, so that's that's a, a very easy way of incentivizing it. Um, and likewise for the, I mean, the outcomes is um, for the one that I showed you, there wasn't a direct link into the results framework for, there was a kind of another step to get to the, the countable outcome in the results framework. Um, but because you have that, you tell them, well, work on getting the information in the interim and it gives you all the ammunition you need to then build up those uh, cases that, that will get counted in the, in the results framework. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, there's a set of questions here that's come up about the, the data itself. Um, and you might want to get a pencil handy because I'm going to give you a few at once and then you can decide how to, how to tackle them. The first from Rosemary, who asks how to decide what is a significant observation um, worthy of actually capturing when there are multiple users sharing observations. Um, another question is if the progress markers are defined, how are unexpected or negative changes uh, reported through the system? Um, a third question is, are the progress markers customized or universal across the projects? And that was from Jenny. And a question here from Cornelia, how do you assess or ensure credibility of the data or do you just take it as given? Could you try and address at least some of those? Yeah. Um, so the Customized or standardized progress markers is a really good question. Uh, it's one we tackled, we sort of struggled with. Um, we, uh, for that project, the one we've shown you, Prize, we actually ended up having a, a standard set of progress markers for each boundary partner type. Um, so across all the projects, across all the countries, um, they use the same progress markers, which is why you can have them in, listed in the form, because everyone comes to the same form and they see the same set of progress markers. Um, we did build in a, a little tweak to the form where if they put in other, they can write in their own progress marker. So they could be adding progress markers to the standard list as they go. And those might be ones that are only, they're, they're, they'll only use and that only apply to their projects or their countries. Um, and uh, if they did add an other, um, it would then get added to the form for next time so they can record it again. Um, they, yeah, and, and likewise, if they clicked other, that's a way of um, uh, allowing them to record observations that don't fit any of the progress markers that they've already defined because um, it was expected that that, that, that could happen. Um, that, you know, the progress markers are not the be all and end all. They're, they're, there was no magic prescience that dictated that we, we knew exactly the change that we would see. So they, um, they were able to record observations that didn't fit against those progress markers. Just like in the, the regular outcome journals that, that you see in the outcome mapping manual. Um, do you want to tackle the other ones, Kaya? Um, sure. Uh, the, how do you assess credibility? Um, I mean, part of it was, so what, one part of it is just being comfortable with a good enough approach, right? We're working with, um, 
while we're working with these kind of four broad groups, we know that, you know, all of these manifest in different ways in different um, countries and different regions. Um, so, I mean, that goes a little bit with the, how do you decide what a significant observation is? Um, they, each malfocal point had to, to decide um, what was significant and they did that. That's why we created the sense-making space. That's why we didn't just leave it to um, observation, recording those observations and then, okay, it's done in an Excel sheet. But the, um, the, the space that was firmly implanted in their calendars and they knew they had to get together every six months to, to ask those questions. Why is this significant? Tell me more about this um, observation that you had. What happened? Um, and through that conversation, um, that was part of the, the credibility kind of check and the, and the you know, the decision around a significant observation um, check. But combined with, you know, being comfortable with a good enough I'm in the approach, right? Um, you know, we can't follow up with um, every single person and every single uh, progress marker. Uh, but if we've got enough of that sense making and enough of that discussion based on on observations and 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 evidence um then is it useful for for adapting our strategy for engagement is it useful for further understanding um these boundary partners and and how they engage with the research how they engage with each other how they um, make decisions um that was kind of a quality check as well are we are we really understanding the system of, of those relationships. Good, thank you um, very much, both of you. I think you did a good job at tackling that um, collection. Um, I'm gonna turn now to look at some questions which relate to the functionality of the platform, the data collection platform you were using. Um, this one here from Kayla, um, which asks in a general terms uh, about the benefits and drawbacks of using uh, Google Forms versus, versus kind of apps such as Podio, which is getting a lot of attention at the moment. Um, and specifically, is there an easy way to support the revision of, of data once it's sub, um, su submitted or not? Um, and then a related question on, in terms of functionality is could those could you could those using the system see um, the data that others had submitted or or, or once they'd submitted um, kind of two questions there once they'd submitted their data could they not see anything until the sense making session where you brought it back to them um, and then lastly on the data um, uh, could confidential data or sources be treated differently or not um, so Pros and cons. I went over some of the pros and cons of uh, Google using the Google Forms. Uh, I haven't actually used Podio, so maybe other people can uh, comment there. Um, and I mentioned that you can do similar things with Microsoft 365 as well. Um, and then other other tools that I'm not sure. I'm you know you can do survey tools. There's lots of different survey tools, and they usually have export functions. But um, I don't think any of them are quite as direct as um, Google and Microsoft 365, where literally you can be watching the spreadsheet and seeing the new entries pop in in real time. Um, it's, it's that direct. Um, access. So you can set different levels of access within the Google suite. So you can, you can say these, these people can see the form and these people can edit the the form or the data rather the data in the background um, and we we enabled the uh, male focal points to be able to see and edit the forms the, the data and the data sheets rather um, which means they can go in and edit the the individual entries um, it's a spreadsheet though so it can be quite messy that's one of the drawbacks like once the data's in um, it's not like you can pull up that entry and have it in your nice form where you can edit it and then resubmit it. Um, uh, there's no way to do that. So you literally edit it in the spreadsheet, um, which can be yeah, a bit, a bit uh, difficult to find things and a bit difficult to you know, do text editing in, in a long, if it's a big paragraph. So that's one of the drawbacks. Um, 
yeah, there was the final question, which I've forgotten. The final confidentiality. question, uh, confidentiality, I think you touched on. Uh, yeah, you, so you can, you can uh, make sure that the data sheet is only accessible and viewable by certain people. You can control that. Very good, very handy. Uh, anything to add, Kaya? No, this is why I work with Simon. <laughs> so I don't have to do that part. <laughs> Indeed, um, very, very handy talent. Right, we've got some questions um, here about turning now to the sense-making side of it. Um, Steve Perry asks about the text analysis and the content rather than you know, going beyond, okay, it was this progress marker. And, and could you say something more about the analysis of that content and, and how that was unpacked during, during sense-making and related to that, a question from Pablo is how to, as he puts it, systematize or make use of the information in a monitoring session. If he could elaborate a little on that, Kaya, perhaps? Sure. Hi, Steve. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so the, the I many focal points, as Simon said, is they were the ones that had direct um, access to the document, as well as the ME person at um, ODI. They would be um, kind of the first ones going through um, that at the six month mark, going through all of the, the data that had been inputted. Um, and slicing it in different ways and looking at, um, first of all, just, you know, getting a visual, getting the numbers, seeing um, where there might be a majority of expect to seize or like to seize or love to seize, comparing with countries, comparing with the type of boundary partner as well. Um, and just uh, uh, looking to see if there's anything surprising around that. Um, but then also going and looking through um, the qualitative piece of it, the narrative piece of it, um, in a in a systematic way and and trying to understand if um, as I said if there are you know what are the trends that we're seeing what are any outliers that we're seeing and they would draw that out um, to then take to the larger discussion group the actual sense making session with the research team um, or any clarifications as well and the ODI colleague and myself, we do a bit of quality control on that. And it was interesting, the first, um, as I said, the, uh, you know, we just kind of started this with this group of, of m and &E focal points, it was new for them. So when we did some of that quality control of the progress markers in the, the first few times they inputted it, um, we were seeing a lot of, of um, statements that read like outputs and not um, change in the actual uh, boundary partner when they, and what the boundary partner um, uh, had done or said or interacted or, or reacted. Those were the types of observations we we're looking for. And they, they were automatically putting in, uh, well, the project did this or the project did that. Um, so that was a bit of a, of a learning moment as well, just going through um, and changing some of those observations in the text and doing that that quality control. Um, so then uh, the M&E focal points had had different ways of addressing and, and discussing, um, analyzing the data with the larger group of, of researchers. Um, as I mentioned, we suggested kind of an outline, like a facilitator's outline of, of you know, key questions they might wanna ask and, and how they might wanna run the session. Um, but we left it up uh, to them to, to um, generate that discussion and um, draw the conclusions around the, the data to have this four page, um, four to six page report, but seeing in the progress markers and again, what they would want to change or adapt in their own engagement strategies. How can we get better according to what um, the data is telling us? So they did that, they did that in different ways. Um, yeah, it was up to the, the kind of personality and the, and the skill of the, of the M&E focal point. Great. Anything to add, Simon? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Kaya, very much. Um, I've asked in the chat if anyone else is, uh, in the audience here has got uh, relevant experience directly with Google Forms or with something similar. And uh, uh, Nicoletta in Geneva has uh, suggested she does and would be happy to take a minute or two to share something of, of her experience. That would be very interesting. I invite you to, to uh, let us know what you used and any lessons, uh, any, any uh, 
observations on how it contrasts any benefits or not compared to Google Forms. So that'd be great. Over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, everyone. So basically, I think there's um, two or three main things to keep into to keep into consideration. Um, one is um, one of the most important things in terms of complying with uh, European data privacy law, which is um, one of the most, if not the most, um, let's say, strict law on data privacy is um, where the servers are based. Um, so when you when you go check and you look at into any kind of platform, it is very useful to see if these are based if these servers are actually based in in European um, within the European continent or the EU, let's say, um, including the UK and, and Switzerland and, and Norway, for example. Um, whereas there are um, the second thing to take into consideration is through which channels actually we're, we're going to use these type of service. So this is in terms of data privacy, it's a very important thing. I'm sure I haven't yet worked with any um, survey tool that actually complies to these law, but I have just done, done a quick um, Google research on it and there's one that is called Question Pro and apparently they are complying with the EU um, data privacy. So that should be, um, maybe you guys can go and check that out. Um, what I have been using though, we have been using is uh, open software, which what allows is that um, people who actually have uh, enough, let's say, programming knowledge can actually go and see the code behind it. Um, so it is easier to see um, if there's anything, any part of data that is being extracted for whatever other um, reason or, or, or that is, you know, that the, if the data is, if anyone else is looking into your data, which we know for a fact that, for example, um, Google is, uh, well, you know, first of all, on Amazon servers, which are more in the US, um, and, and that, the, that the data might be open to, you know, certain type of people. Um, so this allows you to um, know how the coding is done. Not me, I'm not a programmer, but for people who have a lot of experience with this can actually look into it. And I can recommend Service CTO or Kobo. Um, which is based on the ODK of the World Bank. Um, so they are just interfaces of the ODK from the World Bank, which actually work um, pretty well. Um, again, these, these are the servers I think are based in the US as well. Um, so you might have a, a, an issue with this, but depending on what you're working on, it can be you know, good enough. And they're pretty simple to use. They're not, they're may, maybe not as straightforward as Google Forms is, um, but it also allows you to present questions a bit in a different way. There's, there's some very minimum coding or adjusting to do, and you can, for example, do sliders and other types of things that you would not be able to do with, um, with a simple Google Forms. I think that's, that's the main two things to, to keep in mind. Very helpful. Thank you, Nicoletta. It sounds like people should turn to you for, for advice if they want to take uh, any of that forward. So no not, least on the, on the, not least on the data, cons how to manage data and all of the sensitivities around that. Um, we've got a, a question um, in here from uh, Gerard Langlois. Um, how did you handle project pivots or changes in progress markers? For example, if you added or deleted a marker during a program review, did you retroactively adjust any previously collected data that were tagged to a specific progress marker? You talked about adding, but did you do anything retrospective in terms of adjusting what you had captured? Does that make sense? So if we adjusted the progress marker itself? Yeah, so if you added or deleted a progress marker, did you then, what did you do then with um, data which had been related to that, tagged to that progress marker? Right. Um, that, uh, and that, uh, yeah, that did happen even, even the deleting. And um, we included, as a group, we, so part of the process as well is that we would get together um, with the M&E focal points um, every month as well to kind of have updates, discussions, and then, you know, we'd make sure we'd, we'd have a, a longer meeting after these um, six months, their internal six month meetings. Um, so that's where we would have the chance to discuss um, and come to an agreement if a progress marker should be changed. Um, and 
get cl get clarity on why it should be and that explanation would um then be fed into uh different sorts of reports um in the sections of the reports the overall program report um that it, that explained how engagement was happening so we had the opportunity to to be able to to explain okay this this part of the pathway kind of stopped short and now we're veering off or we're adjusting it to to continue on and these are some of the reasons why based on the observations that we've seen good thank you thank you for addressing that one it's tricky uh, quite tricky in some ways i um we we have um uh, an offer here from phil and mariam smith to share some uh, of their experience in using Google Sheets um, as a journal logging tool across multiple teams. I, we haven't got a whole lot of time left, but if you had any insights to contrast with, uh, compare contrast with what we've heard so far in a couple of minutes, that'd be really good to hear. Sure, yeah. Um, across teams in multiple locations. Um, and basically we had a system directly in Google Sheets. So we skipped the kind of form part where we had one sheet where people logged in the, um, the sort of specific observations that they've seen. And then the team sat together there on a monthly basis to then kind of do a, a judgment call of where they felt progress was at in, in relation to each of the progress markers. Um, the nice thing of doing it like that, each team had, had access to their own data, could use it for their own analysis. Um, they uh, then sort of helped to, to bring it all together. You could sort of see the overview. We were able to do some also some kind of heat map type charts to show where was change happening in the different locations where the different teams were working and, uh, and that kind of thing. So it was a bit, it was simpler kind of in terms of to, um, because you didn't have the form in that sense, but I think as Simon was sort of suggesting earlier, there's a certain risk in terms of um, things could get messy if people messed up some of the, uh, the, the Excel or the Google Sheet formulas and things like that. So that was always a bit of risk. You have to really lock it down so people don't change it. One of the cool things we found, um, which was quite useful, was that you could use Google's automated translation tool. So in that situation, people actually write in doing the journal in Khmer, the national language of Cambodia, and it automatically translates it over to English for other people to look at who didn't, couldn't read Khmer. Wasn't the greatest translation, I can say that, at least at the time, this was a few years ago. Um, but it gave you kind of a, a sort of rough picture of what people were talking about. That was, that was kind of cool. I'll leave it there. <laughs> A lot I could say, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> perhaps uh, on another occasion. Thank you uh, very much for sharing that. Um, perhaps uh, the last question here um, coming in from, I think, Egidi, um, to forgive me if I didn't pronounce that right. To what extent, to, it's quite a technical one, this. Um, maybe, Simon, you better prick up your ears. To what extent do the Google Forms allow data cleaning and quality checks? Can data clerks make changes without creating duplicates? Uh, yeah, so as we, we've mentioned, the data goes into a spreadsheet um, and you can give people access to that spreadsheet. Um, you know, if you've got uh, someone who's designated as a sort of data check person, data clerk as you call them, then um, you can give them access, they can go in. Um, they, they just edit the data straight in the cells of the spreadsheet, um, so it doesn't create any duplicates. Um, Google Sheet and I think also Microsoft 365 um, will save changes as you go. So you can always revert back to previous versions um, or see you know, who's been editing what. Um, so if you feel like people have gone in and edited or made a mistake and deleted a whole section, um, you can go in and, and recover that quite easily. Good, thank you very much. I Just to come back myself on one of the questions there, comparing it to um, Google Forms, which I don't have direct experience with, to uh, Podio, which I use quite a lot in my own work. 
Um, a nice feature of Podio, which I think sets it apart from Google Forms, is that you have a nice way of um, commenting using in track changes. Um, you, so you can go back and forth with whoever submitted the data. Um, you can you can give them comments back, or you can suggest some edits to what they said. And is this what you really meant? And, and those kind of questions. It handles that kind of interactivity really nicely. So that's one 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 up for Podio just on that front, perhaps. We are nearly time up. Any final questions? We've got some very useful um, links being put up there in the chat from Kaya, from Nicoletta, to the various resources. So thank you very much for that. We are um, going to draw this to a close. Um, so a huge round of applause, please, for Kaya and Simon. Put a huge amount of effort into making this possible. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, more webinars coming up, but if you haven't already registered, I'm afraid they're already booked up. I wish I could say sold out, but they're for free, so I won't. Um, and but we do have lots of events coming up. Um, Outcome Mapping London Community events in the last quarter of the year, which will be announced very shortly. So keep your emails uh, alert to your emails. So we have uh, training and different kinds of events coming up. Um, the video from this event will be shared via the community, um, as well as the slides um, and any resources which uh, from the chat which has been shared. So again, thank you, and looking forward to seeing you at the next one, hopefully. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thanks, everyone.